You're listening to the Monday Market Highlights brought to you by Milford. Good morning. It's Monday, 6th February, and I'm Brendan from Milford Asset Management. Last week, there was plenty for investors to get their teeth into, from central bank meetings and macro data to US corporate earnings. On the central bank front, the US Federal Reserve hiked the Fed funds rate by 25 basis points to between 4.5 and 4.75%. Changes in the statement outline the committee's focus has shifted from the pace of rate hikes to the extent of future increases, with some participants interpreting that as meaning hikes in excess of 25 basis points are all but ruled out going forward in this tightening cycle. In contrast to the hawkish statement, the press conference showed some dovish signs. Powell was at pains to talk to the disinflation we're seeing come through in recent data points, and rather than push back on recent easing of financial conditions, he noted that conditions had tightened significantly over the past year. The market certainly interpreted these comments in a dovish light, with the Nasdaq rallying 3.5% and the S&P 500 rallying 1.5% on the day. The Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee raised the bank rate by 50 basis points to 4% last week, however removed a lot of the more hawkish language from the statement. The removal of the word forcefully from the statement suggests the bank are likely to step down to 25 basis point hiking increments going forward, and the comment about looking at the impact of the significant increase in bank rates so far implies the bank feels it's closer to the end of the tightening cycle. The shift in language is unsurprising, given the material fall in UK natural gas futures since December, meaning household energy bills are now likely to fall below the energy price guarantee from the second half of this year. This eases the inflationary burden thus requiring a less aggressive monetary policy reaction than it may have. Finally on central banks, the European Central Bank met last week and hiked the deposit rate by 50 basis points to 2.5%, while reinforcing the intention to raise rates by another 50 basis points in March. The tone was generally more hawkish, with the bank noting that core inflation was still too high, thus more work was needed. In economic data, the key release of the week was Friday's US non-farm payrolls, which surprised the market by printing at a huge 517,000 versus expectations of 188,000. Importantly, average hourly earnings printed in line with consensus at 0.3% month on month, but the huge rise in payrolls does suggest that rate hikes are having a much smaller impact on the less interest-sensitive areas of the economy, and more tightening will be required. In New Zealand, we got a read on the state of the employment market, which outlined a still very strong market, but the data was a touch softer than economists had expected. The unemployment rate printed at 3.4% versus expectations of 3.3%, but it was the average hourly earnings number that perhaps surprised most, printing at 0.9% versus 2.6% in September. The slowdown in wage inflation is likely welcomed by the RBNZ, but the labour market generally remains very tight. It was a busy week on the corporate earnings front, with major US tech names reporting. Meta came at the start of the week with a renewed strategy focused on delivering a structurally more efficient company. Management outlined FY23 OPEX and CAPEX guidance 5 and 12% lower, respectively, outlining this focus on efficiency. In fact, Meta Management said the word efficiency over 25 times during the 60-minute earnings call. The market clearly liked what they heard, with the stock up 23% on the day, the largest single-day gain in nearly 10 years. Unfortunately for tech bulls, the positivity stopped there. Apple, Amazon and Alphabet all reported results later in the week, which outlined that a slowing economy was weighing on demand. Apple missed earnings estimates for a range of reasons, including FX impacts, supply constraints and broader macro challenges. The guidance for another quarter of revenue declines also disappointed the market and implies a negative 21% quarter-on-quarter decline. For Amazon, the slower-than-expected Amazon Web Services growth and margin compression increased investor concerns around cloud, which resulted in the stock falling over 8%. In Australian equities, insurer IAG provided renewed guidance on the back of the terrible flooding seen in New Zealand last week. IAG reported an excess of 15,000 claims for Auckland floods, which suggested they would therefore breach the $236 million retention. The result is a revision to FY23 reported insurance margin from 14 to 16% to 10%, a material decrease. The stock closed the week down 7%. Flight Centre came to the market to raise $180 million to fund the acquisition of UK leisure business Scott Dunn. Flight Centre also provided a trading update, noting first half EBITDA of $95 million, 17% ahead of consensus, and above their own guidance of $70 to $90 million. They also provided FY23 EBITDA guidance of $250 to $280 million, broadly in line with consensus, but implying a weaker second half versus forecasts. Software business Megaport delivered disappointing results last week, 
outlining further slowing of key metrics. The business added just 39 customers in the quarter, the slowest ever. Ports additions were also soft at 203 for the quarter versus expectations closer to 400. Management noted that the recent softness in gross additions is likely down to economic conditions, slowing customer decision making. The market clearly wasn't happy yet with these poor metrics, with the stock down 25% on the day. In the week ahead, the key event for us is the RBA on Tuesday, where the market is pricing an 80% chance of a 25 basis point rate hike. We have seen some more conflicting data in Australia in recent weeks, with extremely strong wage growth data, but very poor retail sales. So it'll be interesting how the RBA interprets this. Elsewhere, we will be watching UK GDP, European retail sales, and the remaining US corporate earnings. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next week.